All right, welcome everyone. We are excited. This is uh, the sixth and final session that we are offering this summer of the STAR Virtual Professional Development. Today's session is focusing on classroom and lab ideas, and we've got four really diverse and, and exciting topics that are going to be brought to us today. Uh, I'm excited to hear from these teachers, all of which do a great job in the classroom and lab, and um, it's something I think is going to really help prepare us for this school year. Before we get started with our first presenter, I have a couple of quick things I wanted to remind everybody about if, you're, if you've not participated in one of these yet. First of all, you all should be muted throughout the presentation, and that kind of helps move, move the meeting along quickly. And uh, you may have questions. What I ask is that if you will submit those through the chat, that will be, uh, that will be seen and we'll be able to uh, let those presenters either acknowledge them in real time or they can respond to you after they're done presenting, um, either through a chat or, or reach out to you later. And so that'll help keep this uh, moving along. I also want to remind you that this video is being recorded. And so we will archive this like we have done with all of the other sessions and make these sessions and the resources that are attached to them available for you. Once the first presenter begins, I'll go ahead and send the chat, um, in the chat, a link to the Google Drive folder that has the uh, PowerPoints and documents that they, the presenters will be using. And so you'll be able to access those and follow along. They're also going to share their screens. Um, and then at the conclusion of this session, I want to remind everybody, we're going to send another link. And that's just of a Google form for you to fill out a quick survey to evaluate this last session, help us make some plans and prepare for future opportunities that we're going to be able to offer. Um, but with that, uh, we're ready to begin. And our first presenter is Ms. Ashley Bradbury, and she is at Davis, and she has a great background in food science, and she's going to share with us, because that was something I know a lot of people were excited about learning about as a subject and how to teach it. She's going to share with us some really good ideas on how to get students started in that world. And so, Ashley, I'm going to hand it off for you uh, to take it over, and uh, you can start whenever. Okay, sounds good. Um, so, like you said, I, my degree is actually in food science. I started out ag ed, switched to food science, and have come back around to ag ed, which I absolutely love. But I have a lot of classes through food science, and when Mason asked me about this, I was like, okay, do I do a lesson over HACCP, or uh, food safety, or biosecurity? Like, what do I share about? And I ultimately came and decided that you guys probably want to know how to your eighth and ninth grade in the CIMC book, which that's what I use, but there is a uh, food science unit in both of those. And that's probably more relevant to everyone than just how to teach food science because I'm teaching a whole class about it. So if you want to know about how the class goes, next year is my first year about it. So just, um, I will put my, um, email and cell phone in the chat and you can hit me up later. So I am going to walk through my lesson plan because um, it is easier for me to have a, um, have a lesson plan. Um, I <laughs> probably way more detail. All you guys do kind of have OCD and I do a lot of it. So I just put my objectives and stuff. My principal doesn't really ask for it in case I have objectives. My um uh, and everything and then I just what I do is I just do an outline of what I do everything. So when I start my science lesson um, with the kids. I'll like, kind of do like interest pulling with the kids and I'll have a project and I'll be uh, let's say I have um, a jar salsa. I'll put the jar salsa on my podium and I'll be like, okay, what does it take for it to get in this form? And the kids may say something to expect us you know, you throw the tomatoes, you take the tomatoes, and a the salsa company crushes them up and makes them into salsa. But what I'm thinking about is the transportation of the farm to the um, production plant. Um, I don't think about the other things that go in it, like jalapenos and the onions and all that stuff, and they don't understand that you have to have 
multiple different products to create something as simple as salsa. So we talk about that and we kind of go through that. Um, like right here in my lesson plans, I talk about pickle and like you don't think about it, you know, just cheeks and vinegar, but you know, vinegar is essentially just fermented alcohol, which a lot of you know eighth graders and ninth graders are never going to know that. Um, so it's like um, right here, uh, channel that um, it, none of them are for the um, teaching along with the unit. Um, so they go through some of the uh, scenes. And so I have videos that kind of talk about it. And to me, that's what kids sometimes do. They do better between when I jump around. Um, so I try and jump around in all of my classes. We read, we watch video, we talk about it. Um, and just jumping around a lot. And it seems to keep a little bit more interaction, especially with my eighth graders and ninth graders because their attention span is kind of sometimes a little bit lower. Um, there are several, right, here this modern marbles harvest. And there are a lot of mar modern marbles um, videos that they have that relate to the food industry. Um, and I kind of have a list of those if you guys are interested, like anything from harvesting um, a butcher plant, um, snack foods. Um, it, it's not all, um, it doesn't just have to be this harvesting. Um, you can essentially show any of those. Um, I just choose to put it in there when we're doing harvesting and stuff. Um, and then, um, after we've kind of gone through the production, um, we talk a little bit about processing and stuff. And then I always do some type of activity where they're hands-on and they're actually making it. Um, I know I've talked with Raquel and she says she's done some dried fruit by using a dehydrator and stuff. My first year there I, at Davis, I had a community member that had a fudge kettle and all the stuff to make fudge. And so we, and we made and sold fudge. That was quite extensive. That was a little bit above and beyond necessarily what I wanted to do, uh, but it worked because I was getting it for free and I you know, was trying to increase some money for my program. That worked pretty good. One thing that I did in college as a simple project that I think relates very, very well to high school is um, doing salsa. Salsa is, salsa is great because you have to have multiple different ingredients. You have your onions, you have your salsa, you have bell peppers or jalapenos, um, you have some salt and some spices. And they can find, literally you can send them home with a, an, a, you know, a homework assignment to find a salsa recipe that we, they want to try out. Um, and you essentially can get all those ingredients and have them make salsa and you don't necessarily, um, salsa is acidic enough that um, if you were truly canning it, you should boil it. But if you're just gonna make it and have chips and salsa in class, you don't need to boil it or cook it. Um, unless it ha I mean, unless your kids have some weird ingredient that needs to be cooked. I haven't, you know, I don't think, I've never seen a salsa recipe that had to, ha had to be cooked. Um, one thing we also don't think about in the food industry is, um, and there's a video, this video right here, um, it talks about, it shows a brief, a brief picture where they're measuring the weight of the product. Well, so when you make a homemade recipe of salsa, you might have, it might say to have three cups of chopped tomatoes. Well, in the, in the um, food industry, you don't, you're not going to, you're not going to do it based on cups. You're going to do it based on weight. And you're going to be like, okay, one cup of, of crushed tomatoes weighs, you know, five ounces, whatever it weighs. Um, and, you know, if you want to make a, make a recipe that essentially, um, is a thousand times that you just times your five times 1,000. So I need 5,000 ounces of 
of crushed tomatoes to make this huge batch. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, you can buy a scale, like a, a food scale um, from Walmart for about $15. And so that's what we did when we did the fudge because we were selling it by the pound. And so um, I would recommend that. That was, that was a great investment. And it's a great way to relate the industry to the kids um, without too much of of a chain uh, of, you know, like they can make their one individual recipe, but then I make them weigh, you know, I would make them weigh their three cups of tomatoes and, you know, and to figure out, you know, if we wanted to double this, if we wanted to triple this, Let's say we were making, you know, a 100 times this recipe and we were making a big batch. So I kind of do that with them. They like getting hands on. I will say salsa says something that's like pretty easy and you can definitely do it within your, we have about, I'm going to say we have 47, 48 minutes, something like that. So you can definitely do it within that time period. Um, I have also made um, something else that works good. Pickle, the, there is the pickles that's with this, um, with the CIMC books. That's a good one. Uh, um, you know, if you're going to actually can it, you need to go to the cafeteria and boil some water. We are getting, hopefully getting a stove put in our, in our room so that we can do stuff like that for our, my food science class. But um, part of all that, as you guys know, um, just kind of depends on how this year goes. Um, something else, if you have access to a kitchen, mozzarella cheese is something, it's way, it's, more advanced, but it's something that um, ninth and 10th and even 11th and 12th graders can easily make homemade mozzarella cheese. It's not something that actually takes a ton, you know, of experience to make. And that's not too difficult. Um, I don't know if any of you guys do the, the food science uh, team. Um, I make them um, do you like, because we talk about, you know, making the product, but then you don't think about the marketing and trying to make the product work to others. So if I was having the, if we made salsa, I might would have them pair up and um, market salsa to me. I might would give them a, a scenario. Um, let's see. So this is my food marketing group project and it can it can switch and you can change the scenario I might would put this scenario um, you, you know I would type my scenario and be like we're trying to make the hottest salsa in the world or, or whatever we're tr truly trying to do um, and just give them a scenario to try and market it to to the to the consumers. And so it makes them use their brain to try and market it um, and they're using the same product that way. Um, like I said, you know, you, we don't think about the transportation. We don't think uh, that that's part of it. I think a lot of times um, we think about agriculture and we think about growing the crops and we think about, you know, the raising the livestock and we don't think about using the the products we get from that to making the products that are in the grocery store. So I use some of that to just kind of um, get, the, get their brains thinking about how broad agriculture, and that's what I do like about this unit and teaching it is that um, it makes them kind of reach out and um, think about how broad agriculture and how agriculture can um, how agriculture can fit in a lot of different things. Um, like I said, I am teaching the food science class this year. So we will be doing a lots of like, I'm sure we'll be doing a lot of different hands-on projects. That's my goal is to do mostly hands-on projects and a lot less of the book. Um, my time is almost up. I'm going to get on the chat and answer any questions. Um, Anything you, any questions you have for me, shoot me an email, shoot me a text. 
Um, I'd be happy to um, get hold of those, and um, I'm going to give it back to Mason. Hey, thank you very much, Ashley. That's some really great ideas and a really valuable resource that she shared. I'll make sure you all realize that's in that Google folder that we shared with you, that, that Google Doc that she has and used with her screen. Apologize, we had a few issues with the video and audio lagging early on, but it did correct itself. Um, so make sure you do reach out to Ashley. She's a great resource in the world of food science, um, somebody that's got some ideas. And given that she's teaching a year long class, I'll also be interested to hear more about some ways in which you make that last for the entire year so, and, and the curriculum that you utilize there. Thank you again. Next presenter we have is Mr. Bart Harper from Medill, who's gonna to talk to us about a really, also a great experiential um, project that students can get involved with. Um, and I think it would really be great for a home project this year, if that's something that you need to resort to for a lot of students. And so. It's all about teaching entomology and other kind of maybe undercapped subject in our area that we don't talk about as much. And so I'm going to hand it off to Bart and he's going to share about what he's done with his students. All right, uh, Bart Harper from Mendel. Can you guys hear me? Everything good, Mason? All right, so not to take anything away from Ashley, but when she was doing her presentation, I saw something flying across my classroom like it was a wasp or something. I thought, what is that? And so, you know, hey, bug collections, bug nerds, I went to go get it. And um, so I caught it in a jar. I don't know if y'all can see that, but that's a click beetle. Anyway, I went to go pick him up and he bouncing all over the place. And anyway, so that's pretty cool. So we're gonna talk a lot about some things and um, I am going to share my screen and hopefully I, I get through this in 15 minutes. I'm gonna go uh, pretty fast once I get this done. So uh, if I go too fast and you hit me up later, uh, we'll do all that. So it, it kind of started really um, in service a couple of summers ago and it was an insect adventure at Oklahoma State. So by no means, absolutely no means am, am I an uh, entomology expert. I just um, attended this workshop I took my youngest son right there, Snaggletooth, um, took him with me and, and he loves it and loves bugs. And, and really, I just, after that, you start seeing bugs. You know, it's kind of like buying a new car that you don't think anyone else has and then you see them all up and down the road. So, um, you know, for every one human, there are like 2 billion insects for every one human. There's 30 million different species of bugs. So, you know, a lot of times kids don't even think of, of those as animals. Uh, they just think of them as something totally disgusting. So, you know, uh, this was kind of more pictures of the insect adventure, which, you know, I would just say Adrena Shufran, uh, the lady there with the short hair kind of in the middle, she's in charge of that. She actually works through OSU Extension. Uh, man, they love to have you come by at any time. They'll even come to your school and and those types of things. So again, uh, I am no expert. I just have a lot of fun doing it. And so I can get on the same level as the ninth graders that I teach and we can all kind of have fun. And like I said, it started out with my son. We did a little bug collection for the county fair. Um, didn't really know what we were doing, but hey, there's no wrong way to do it. And uh, this was his first entry a couple years ago to the county fair and, and he gets into it and, um, He's like a pro now. So as, as I was mentioning, uh, you can go online, you can look up a lot of things and, and really that's kind of the best way to do it. So when I start teaching, um, I do this in the fall because there's a lot of bugs, you know, and, and I know it's maybe a weird time of the year, um, but I don't know, there's, it's sometimes hard to find when it's right and when it's wrong. You do it with eighth graders, you do it with freshmen. Uh, you can teach this in a horticulture class. Um, you can even teach it in animal science. You know, a lot of, you know, when you go to vet school, you have to have a certain amount of entomology hours and most people don't realize that. Um, just the, the whole coordination of all that. And so we actually do a bug collection. We try to do everything and it's not uh, crazy extensive. You know, I only ask that they 
have at least five bugs. And so that's not really that hard. Uh, most of your really good information, or at least easy enough to understand information, is right there on the OSU webpage, the uh, CDE webpage. You go to the, the handbook, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys can see that, but you just click on that, that handbook and there'll be a lot of easy to understand things, uh, general information. We don't do the contest. Uh, I don't know, we could at some point, and, but what we're teaching is just kind of some fun stuff, you know, um, things like what do orders mean? You know, you, you teach the whole um, kingdom, family, uh, phylum, all the way down to species and, and orders in there and what in the world does orthoptera mean? Well, they can break it down and make it easy for kids to remember and understand. I know the eighth grade curriculum has a unit uh, that does a lot about entomology and there's some good resource stuff there too. Uh, one of the books, and I actually ordered this because uh, Dr. Shufran told us to, it was really good, is uh, uh, Kaufman Field Guide to finding, basically, you catch a bunch of bugs and you have no idea what they are. And so, <laughs> you, I guarantee you, look them up in this book, don't look them up on the internet because it just won't work. But this book is very good for that. Um, and maybe we'll get you a resource for that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of insects in pop culture and things like that we don't realize. And, you know, so I start kids off, you know, we're gonna teach them the basics and we're gonna go over that. And, uh, but I start with something interesting and, and I like to find pictures and videos. And I don't have the video for you, but it's easy to find on YouTube. You can find videos of praying mantises killing hummingbirds. And so, <laughs> If you think of that, and you think of a praying mantis being a vicious predator, then you understand why Kung Fu Panda maybe had one on their, in their little movie deal. So that's pretty cool. Uh, a lot of bugs have a lot of really cool things about them, and so that kind of gets them interested. Um, so, you know, we kind of make this in a couple of days, uh, several days, a couple of weeks actually, uh, if you're not careful. Of course, you have to be organized and you have to manage things. Um, but the first thing is to make the box. And what I ask those kids, like day one, bring a, a shoe box. Okay, so these are things they provide from home. Uh, a shoe box, uh, not too big. You don't want a boot box, but you don't want something really small. Uh, uh, like a Nike box, I, I don't know if you can tell, something kind of like that's what you're looking for. Uh, it has a lid, they can write their names on it. Um, we're gonna have a box. That is foam. I don't know if you guys can tell. It's like just insulation foam you get at the hardware store. Uh, polystyrene, you cut it, their little white balls go places. They make a blue foam that doesn't do that. It's real, it's a whole lot better. Uh, but that's what that is. So we trace them out. I do the cutting. Obviously, I'm not gonna hand ninth graders a bunch of razor blades to cut these out. They're about the same size as the box. It's gonna fit snug. It's gonna go into the bottom of that box and it's gonna be for their bug collection. This is not a long-term deal. They're not gonna keep it for 20 years, but it provides a, it's a good thing for an easy insect collection. Inside that box, it's just a, a simple table. Made this up, uh, common name, order, metamorphosis, mouth parts, are they pests, beneficial? That kind of follows along in that CDE, um, but honestly, it's just a, a rubric, a good way to grade them. So I grade them for the box, and then ultimately on their collection, I'm gonna grade them on filling this out too with their samples. Uh, the other thing that I ask the kids to bring is a jar, a kill jar. And so these are the options. Again, I'm not asking kids to go out and spend money. And if for some reason they absolutely can't, I have a few jars, you know, go to Walmart, get the jars, you know, so, so back to like the foam, that would be something I would purchase. I don't ask kids to bring that. Um, the jars, I would buy a few of those too. But they they need to bring a jar. I give them a grade for that. You got two different lids. The lid on the left looks like it's hard to use. Actually, that's easier because it's a little thin, I don't know, the little disc part when you actually use the jar to uh, capture them, you can slide that under and you can get that bug a little easier. It kind of depends. So that's the first thing. 
So <clears throat> then we're gonna come into like another day just making kill jars. You know, again, you're, you're dealing with a lot of kids sometimes and it's, it's a challenge. This is a basic way and you can look up other ways uh, on the web or whatever to make a kill jar. Basically, you use cotton balls and you're gonna put, uh, you can use alcohol. The best thing is really the best thing to use on that is gonna be acetone and you wanna use pure acetone. There's other chemicals out there that are a little more dangerous. Um, nail polish remover, but 100% pure acetone, that's gonna be the best stuff. And so that's an easy way to make one. And the end result is gonna look a little bit, bouncing around here too much, a little bit like that. And one of the problems you run into, if you keep this very long-term is that cardboard will get wet, you know, because you're putting acetone in it and, and bugs may get down in it and crawl around in the cotton and you may not want that. We did this and I don't necessarily recommend it to everyone, but if you want to go a, a little above and beyond, we made a, a kill jar that basically has sawdust in the bottom and it has plaster of Paris on the top. And I don't know if you guys have ever worked with plaster of Paris, but you know, it's a thing and, and it's messy and, and it's what we did. And what this does, it provides, um, that sawdust in the bottom absorbs your acetone and holds it and locks it in longer and it keeps that jar charged as a killing agent a lot longer than the cotton okay and you get plaster of paris at the hardware store it's easy whatever you're mixing it up have a big old trash can use paper plates use uh, paper cups use paper spoon or plastic spoons because plaster of paris will set hard on things and you do not put it down the drain it will clog your drains. So don't pour that stuff out, okay? Throw it in the trash. But what I did is I went to Atwoods and got some wood pellets and I spent one day, I got them soaked so they would spread apart. And then after they dried, that's what we used. Uh, that was the only way I could really come up with sawdust. I wasn't gonna get the circular saw out there and get a bunch of two by fours. <laughs> so like I said, that's what we ended up with. And as it was drying, we put a nail in it for a small nail hole and that lets that acetone go to the bottom a little quicker, okay? Again, I think the plaster of Paris just itself, I've done that too, and it's it's porous enough to hold some acetone, so, so that would also make a kill jar, okay? Now you've got a kill jar, you got a box, we're gonna collect some bugs, we're gonna do that. What do we pin them with? Well, on the right you can see it's called BioQuip is a company. It's one of the companies that sells entomology pins. Or on the left, it looks like I went to Hobby Lobby or Walmart and just got some sewing pins. And you can do that too. Trust me, you're, you'll want to do that, especially if you're pinning a whole bunch of bugs and, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so, so back to uh, what we actually do. So in the middle of this, you have to manage teaching some things. And of course, my kids have uh, notebooks and they keep notes and and we talk about things and I write things on the board and they've got to keep all that you know and so you kind of manage that we make the the box and we're gonna have some extra foam and so every kid and you can I'll back up a little bit but every kid's gonna have a box and they're gonna have their name on it and then they're gonna have a little piece of foam with their name on it. okay and and so when they pin their bug and they want to move their legs around, or they want to do all that kind of stuff, they don't really need to do that in the box. It gets a little cumbersome. So they need to just have a little blank cube. I don't know, you can make them as big as you want to or as small as you want to. That's, that's how they're gonna work on their bug. And backing up, I'm fortunate enough, if you look here in this picture, you can see a whole bunch of shoe boxes in the background. And, and I have a, a pretty good little storage area that we can, you know, I can have all the first hours in one area and all the second hours in another. And, you know, a couple years ago, I had almost 70 Ag1 kids. So that was a whole mess. But so, so back to kind of the pinning, you know, I don't know if you can tell in this picture, but this is what they call a spread board. So some of your bugs that you want to display their wings, like uh, butterflies and, and really, you know, a majority of the insects, have wings. If you want to display their wings, you can put their body, in, in this is foam 
with Elmer's glue. That's the, and, and to set it hard, we just put pins through it. And then the next day it, it sets hard, if that makes any sense. That's a, that's a spread board. You can look that up on the internet. You can make your own, it's, it's real easy. Here's another example of a spread board. Um, again, if you work with Lepidopterus butterflies and you mess with their wings a lot, you're gonna rub off all the, the little scales is what those are. And you can mess up your collection and, and those kinds of things. And so this kid's using little strips of paper. I mean, you just use scissors and cut little strips of paper and kind of work on them and different things like that. Uh, this particular girl, you know, her butterfly was small enough. She didn't even use a spread board, but that's kind of what you're looking at. You get into things like um, you can get real creative, you know, like that praying mantis on the left. Honestly, I don't guess I realize their wings look like that. You know, there's a lot of insects that we don't really know what they look like. And so once they, you, you start getting their legs just right and you can start working with their wings and this, that, and the other. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do. And so kids, man, they just love it. And not only that, it, it kind of goes back to the whole uh, hands-on approach. You know, we talk about uh, three body segments. We talk about antennas, we talk about wings, we talk about those things that make them insects. And uh, once they start pinning those bugs, and I know it sounds really simple, but then they can actually see it and they can look at the mouth parts and they can look at the robber fly on the left and they can go, man, I can see where that thing can really siphon something out. Or, you know, they can look at a, a dragonfly that has this huge mouth comparatively to its body and then they know man yeah it's a vicious predator you know around the lakes and ponds and so um they see it when they do it and and this would kind of be an example of what a finished product would look like um you know there's a lot of things i know i left a lot out i'm going really fast um i, I just kind of get through a few things we we got into it and I bought a cabinet from that BioQuip. It kind of expensive, but I thought, you know what the heck? It's an empty cabinet, doesn't come with any bugs, <laughs> but that's what you're buying. And, and so a lot of these kids, like when it's over, I tell them, take your bugs home, do with them what you want. A lot of them are like, eh, I don't want them. Mom doesn't want them. I'm like, okay, we'll just keep them up here and we'll put them in our little collection and whatever. So, so we have some bugs. Um, there's some little, you know, you could put a mothball in those to keep them from um, whatever. Just some other little things. Let's just go real quick. Uh, let's say someone brings a bug to a kid and it's been dead for two weeks or longer and it's all stiff. If they really wanted to, they can steam it uh, and it softens it up. Anyway, they can do that. Um, if you have a collection, you can put it in the freezer for a certain amount of time and it'll keep it. There's microscopic skin beetles that will attack uh, a bug collection, just like they will attack a taxidermy deer if you're not careful. So you set that thing in a deep freeze for a little while and um, it'll take care of that. If they want, we don't, I tell them, we're not catching spiders because that's not an insect, but we talk about the whole arachnid deal. But if for any reason you want to collect some soft shelled uh, arthropods, then all you really put them in is alcohol. You know, if you had a little test tube, like a hand sanitizer, which is a gel, actually keeps that thing suspended, where this is just rubbing alcohol, so they just fall to the bottom. Um, but those would be examples of some things, if you just wanna show them off, like we've got the dog tick, we've got some caterpillar, I don't know what that is, and then we've got a black widow spider. You know, they'll lose their color a little bit, but, but that's okay. So, you know, those are honestly, and like I said, I tried to go uh, pretty quick. Uh, it's a lot of fun. This is something I, you know, I give them several grades on and I, I can see that this is something that we could do uh, through Google Classroom. You know, they can collect these bugs, they can catch them. And I guarantee you, once you, start collecting bugs and doing this, you see them all the time. And then people are like, Mr. Harper, I saw this huge moth on the side of the school. I'm like, let's go get it. So we took, you know, like this Folgers coffee can. And so uh, 
I just think it sticks better when it's hands on and it's a lot of fun. And I'm sorry I rambled so much. And I don't know, Mason, that's kind of what I had. I, um, I appreciate it. That, there's a lot you can talk about there. And for the sake of time, I wish we could hear more. And at, if there's more to add at the end, let's hear more, Bart. And then we're going to transition, though. Um, I thought that was great. Uh, but let's let's hear from our third speaker so we can get back on track. And then if you have questions, definitely send those to Bart in the chat. Um, the third speaker we have today is Mr. Seth Reeves from LADA, who's going to talk to us uh, as a used water dealer. That's the project that he's done with his students. That's really unique. And he's got a video to share as well. And so I'm going to hand it off to you, uh, Mr. Reeves, and then you can take over from there. Thank you again, Bart. Okay. Um, very, very much inadequate following those two, but... We're going to get going. I've got to stand up after I push play to uh, put my microphone close to the speaker. So um, just a little short five minute video and then I'll get back on there and finish up. So let's get this going. My very first year, it was in the spring of my first year, finished up my first year of teaching ag here at LADA. Uh, email come across, said apply for a living to serve grant, which is part of the FFA motto. It's the last three words, living to serve. And that's what we focus on is serving others here at LADA. I thought, you know what? Let's try to harvest rainwater, get completely off the tap. Three years ago, we received a grant from National FFA to put in a rain harvest system. And uh, what our goal was is to get completely off the school's tap for our greenhouse and our aquaponic system. Uh, what we have here is what it would need to look like on your home. This is our rain harvest system. We have our gutters to catch the rain as it comes off the roof. As it passes through the gutter and passes into the leaf eater, all the sediment is gonna settle into the settling pipe so your clean water goes over to the tank. It's predicted now that by the year 2050, the world's population will reach 9.6 billion. So that's a lot of food that we're gonna have to produce by that time for as many people as we'll have. So this is just another solution. If we use the underused uh, buildings that we have in our urban cities, I think that'll help the problem a lot. We used city water and rainwater and did a test, you know, which one grew the best, which one grew the fastest, which one had the thickest base and, and, and rainwater uh, by far. And once the kids started seeing, you know, seeing a kid whenever they're going along and at first they think, well, Reeves, he's just crazy, you know, we're. We're catching water off the roof and then this, when they started seeing the benefits and they started seeing the research and they started seeing what people uh, you know investors have done by started buying up water rights and they see oh there is something to this they can see the real impact of you know rain water harvest and how how easy it is and how effective it can be and how important it is and it's something that everybody can do I mean, you don't have to be a school teacher or a student or a professor at Oklahoma State or whatever. I mean, anybody can harvest rainwater. As you can see, we just came on the backside and guttered the backside of the ag building and then diverted it into these two tanks. We have a thousand gallon tank and a 500 gallon tank that we use. We're in the process of building a new ag building. So we've torn our greenhouse down, which used to sit right in this area here where the trailer is now. And what we would do is we would pump out of our 500 and thousand gallon tank into our nurse tank that set inside the greenhouse. And this is what we would water out of daily, um, our vegetables and flowers and different things that we were growing at the time. And this is where we would also have our nurse tank to go to our aquaponic system inside the classroom. Something to consider when you're placing your tanks is Whenever they get so full, they have overflows. That overflow is going to hit and it's going to erode whatever's underneath it. So we chose to set ours on rocks. You can do concrete. You can do whatever you need to, but make sure you think about that. A couple of our grow beds that we had in our greenhouse. This is the side that the plants would obviously sit in, in their uh, soilless media. Here's what the bottom look like. I think these are just small uh, stock tanks. A few other cool projects we've done with our water is... Um, that's ours too. Grow cucumbers and then we grew them up and then my Ag One class taught them how to pickle them and to can them to preservation techniques and how they can just continue to 
see how everything kind of just comes full circle. One of the goals that we had of this project was, personally as a chapter, we wanted to have 2,000 gallons of storage out in the community based on the knowledge that we've given them. Um, it was pretty awesome to see that we were able to surpass that. And just in from direct contact from what we did here at Lattice School, we have over 13,000 gallons of storage in the community that people, as they came and heard our program and heard what we were doing and gained more knowledge, they wanted to go out and do it themselves. So when you think about starting something like this, don't think about what it's going to look like in your chapter. Don't think about what it's going to look like on a, an award application. Think about how you can impact people larger than your chapter, larger than yourself. Um, that's been the greatest reward. We didn't think about getting any awards when we did any of this, but it's been pretty cool. We've been fortunate enough to receive a few, uh, be featured in some different spots, uh, television spots and stuff like that. So again, think bigger picture, like think about how can we teach students once they leave our building, they can use that knowledge to better themselves and better those around them. Okay, so this the Elite Tank there. That is the company. Uh, I don't want to watch that guy. That is the company that um, that we used. Uh, they were just a local company. Um, very easy to deal with. They came out and installed our tanks. One thing we messed up on, as you saw, the nurse tank was white. We we found out real quick that obviously that's going to allow for. Um, growth of algae and things like that. So make sure when you set up your tanks, set up a solid color tank. We had the tan, the green, and the black. None of them grew any um, bacteria at all once we, or algae, once we had uh, the solid color tank. So make sure you have a solid colored tank. Um, the leaf eater, the part that we showed in the video, that is just for residential use. Um, if you're just catching it for your greenhouse, we just used the simple gutter system diverted it in there and then we had a little um, 110 volt uh, pump that we would pump in there and pump over to our nurse tanks. Um, what we liked about that using it in our aquaponic system is you don't have to have a 24 hour evaporation period with rainwater um, to put in there for your fish. You know, if you put city or tap water in, uh, you have to have an evaporation period to get rid of all the, the treatment that it's had. Otherwise you can have a fish kill. And so we've done the water test with it. Um, I actually drank the water. I wouldn't let any of my students drink the water, just, you know, lawsuits, I guess. And so um, I, I, it, it's, it's just a really simple program, but yet it's been really cool to see, like, what it's grown into. Um, you know, different, I've got, I have a student, Sage, you saw there on that. She is now at Oklahoma State, and she is a, um, a biological engineering major, and she is doing nothing but water. Um, in that it's really got the kids interested around here. We sit on top of the Arbuckle Simpson Aquifer, um, which is, you know, to most people in other parts of the state, it means nothing, but that's our drinking water. And how it got started is we kept having so many um, uh, watering restrictions. And so I thought, let's find a way to totally get off the tap. And so we have not used any uh, tap water to water any of our greenhouse or fill up our aquaponic system uh, since we received that grant. And uh, that was in, 2014 and so uh, it's just like I said it's just been really neat to see how it piques kids interest um, it's given us a lot of speech material given it, like I said we just try to do a lot of things that focuses on stuff in our area uh, we have a research diver that comes every year that dives the aquifer once a month and uh, he said there's probably more shrimp under Ada Oklahoma than there is in the Gulf of Mexico it is just crazy they're white they have no eyes um, he discovered a species last year that he had, he got to create his own dichotomous key because there had, had never been discovered in North America. And so his name's Kevin Blackwood. I'd be happy to give you guys his number. He works for the Oka Institute here at East Central. Um, but again, it's just a simple project. We had no idea that, in fact, I even got in trouble from my superintendent for applying for the grant because I didn't ask him first. And we get this check from National FFA and he's like, what's this for? And I was like, oh, well, I got a grant. And so... But it's just, it's been neat to see how it's grown into to something that, like I said, it's, it's something that's bigger than us. And it's something that, you know, those kids can use. And it was neat to see, you know, the goal a kid set of 2,000 gallons in the community storage. And there's 13,000 gallons that people that have come to the, and we had people from OSU come down to um, uh, professors that were uh, focusing on this. They came down and, uh, and did talks with the community. Um, 
we use it as an ag issues forum just to try the contest um, little did i know that ag issues is basically a one-act play i thought it was actually ag issues and a forum that we held all year but hey whatever we go up there we get our butts kicked whatever because um, we didn't have a one act play ready but to me it was a forum uh, but again uh, that's that's all i've got it's a simple project anybody can do it um, it's amazing you won't have to water your greenhouse near as much if you water with rainwater. Uh, we we drain our tanks we we never can use all of our uh, 1500 gallons of water that we that we capture um, real quick i apologize i want to share this real quick screen um, it has the, um, uh, there we go. This area right here, I, I think Mason has this. This is just a catchment equation that we use, like our square foot and the precipitation amount. So if you get like, if you have a thousand square feet and you have one inch of rain, you're gonna catch 623 gallons of water. And so just kind of a way to base, like how big a tank you might need or where you wanna put it or how much guttering you need. And so, but I think, I believe, Mason has all that in um, in those documents and I put elite tanks number down in there uh, simply because uh, like I said they go all over the United States but they're just a local company that um, that really really helped us out so that's all I've got uh, thank you guys for for being here great information we really appreciate that and enjoyed the video as well um, I will refer back to the Google Drive, and I'll, I'll send another, I'll drop that in the chat again so y'all can go and access that again. Uh, but I really appreciate that. That's really fantastic and something you don't hear as much about. And so I know we'd love to hear more, and so um, we'll, we'll dig in later. Um, but before we do that, let's let's hear from our last presenter, uh, Mr. Owen Hossack, who's at Sequoia. He's going to talk about some things that I think are really timely and going to be very beneficial to us as we go into this year in terms of projects that can be hands-on, minds-on, and Get everybody uh, with some projects that their students will enjoy. So we'll hand it off to you, Mr. Hossick. All right, thank you, Mason. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of background and I think that'll help kind of lead us into um, the topic that we're talking about today. Um, I grew up in Owasso, Oklahoma, was a member of the Owasso FA chapter. Um, so that being said, uh, I didn't live on a farm or ranch or anything like that. Um, so a lot of my initial ag experience came through hands-on activities, right, that we did in the classroom and um, kind of developed that passion for, for ag education and the industry as a whole. And so going through college, right, um, I think our professors do a really great job of saying, hey, this is, how, this is what you need to do, right? But they usually don't give you a whole lot of examples or tell you, okay, this is how you need to do it, right? which a lot of that self-discovery is good. But um, so what I did today is I kind of put together um, a document that um, has some different ideas, right? That can be used as a resource as well as there's some links and some other things on there um, that people can use um, to get some ideas. So hold on one second, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, um, so I would, I would say most of us teach definitely in eighth grade or a, um, or an Ag 1 class um, pretty, pretty universally, right? And so what I did is I went through um, each of kind of the different units that you can find in the CIMC book and um, basically made some different ideas for hands-on activities. And the ones that are underlined um, are ones that I feel like you could very easily uh, modify to be able to do at home, right? Um, and so we'll just kind of highlight um, some of those as, as we go through, and um, if you, again, if you have any questions, um, just put them in the chat and we can, we can get to them at the end. Okay, so for food science, right, just something as easy as a home scavenger hunt. So, you know, you know high fructose corn syrup, go find um, an item in your pantry, right, that contains that ingredient or um, some other, you know, some other thing that, that you choose. Um, and just have kids find, you know, 10, 15 of those. And if you're doing it over Zoom, you can do it live. If not, um, you can just make it kind of, a, kind of a worksheet, right? And so you can see that these terms and topics and things like find something that has 15% of your daily um, sugar intake, right, um, on the nutritional facts, right? So we're teaching them, well, where can we find that? We can also then jump off to different, um, different talking points and things. 
plant and soil science. Um, we're fortunate enough behind my ag building, we have about 15 acres of just um, basically pasture land that the school owns. And so we're able to walk around during the plant and soil unit, right? And identify different native grasses. Well, that's something also, you know, kids could, could do at home. Things like uh, range boards are also easy to make. And I've got some pictures here that, that we're gonna show here in a second. Um, the jar of soil, this is by far, and this may be super nerdy, but it is my absolute favorite classroom activity that we do. Um, as Mr. Harper uh, talked about earlier, right? Most kids have access to some type of jar, whether it's an actual uh, mason jar, or um, if you have an empty um, salsa container, or you know whatever, right? Um, basically, all you need is a clear container that you can seal the lid on, and you can use that. Um, basically, you fill it with fill it with a soil sample. It doesn't necessarily matter um, the amount um, per se, um, and the the amount of water that you don't put in necessarily doesn't matter either, right? Um, Put it in, you shake it up, and it will layer as, it, as those different particle sizes basically fall out of, of the water. Um, they will organize themselves into the three different soil particles, so sand, silt, and clay, right? Your sand being the heaviest will fall to the bottom, silt in the middle, then your fine clay particles will be up on top. So then you just measure the total height of um, your sample, right? And then you can easily see you, Mason, can you see my uh, cursor on the, the shared screen? Okay, so you can kind of see, and this is, I should have taken a picture of one, I didn't have one handy, but um, you can kind of see these different areas where um, there's a delineation or there's a change um, in material, right? And so you measure those, um, get your measurements, just through some simple division, you can come up with your percentages, and then you can go to your soil triangle, right? And then you can figure out what type of soil you have, whether it's a uh, loam, sandy loam, one of the 12 um, that you can find on there. Um, and so that's one of my favorite ones um, to do because it's simple. Um, we just, we shake up the jars. We have a table um, in the back room of the ag building that we just set them on. Usually t the sand will fall out in the first five to 10 seconds, the silt in a couple of hours. And it usually takes, um, 24 to 36 hours for that clay to finally fall out of the water. Uh, one trick is if you have some borax detergent, you can add that to the water and it helps it fall out um, a little bit faster. Um, and then we'll figure out what soil type each kid has at their house. And then we'll make a soil map of the area around Claremore where they live, right? And so we can see, okay, well, you're by the Verdigris River, right? So you're gonna have um, some more alluvial type soils than someone who's maybe up on a plain. Um, so that's, that, is one of, that is one of my favorites. Um, there's a YouTube link um, on this here, and I believe it's available in the Google Doc um, that you can go and watch. We're, <laughs> it's embarrassing, it's actually me doing it. Um, our local community college, whenever the, the shutdown happened, um, let us film some lessons and put them on their YouTube channel. So there's an example of, of that particular one. Uh, the beef cattle, one thing um, that I like to talk about is um, the different brands, right? Because it's kind of cool. Somebody's grandpa or, or uncle or whoever, right, might have, have a cattle ranch and they're like, well, what is, what is, the, what is the J6 ranch, right? Um, and so we talk about the different meanings of brands. And then you can take a coat hanger, like the ones that you get um, when you take clothes to the dry cleaner, and you can bend them. Um, hold on, let me stop sharing real quick. So you can bend them to the point where you can basically make um, a little brand, right? And then you can dip it in some paint. And I took the jigsaw and an old piece of plywood that we have, and we would dip it in the paint and stick it on the silhouette of a, uh, of a beef animal. Um, that was a shout out to Marty Jones and the J6 Ranch. Hit him up for all your mini donkey needs. Um, but you can, um, just something real simple, and it, it's, it's fun, right? And not something um, that um, takes a whole lot of, a lot of effort or requirement. Another great um, resource is um, for genetics. So I usually teach genetics um, whenever we get to the sheep unit, um, when we talk about um, spider disease, dwarf gene, um, and scrapies resistance. And there's a, there's a cool little game there. You can 
highlight the link and, and put it in. And basically you flip a coin a um, bunch of different times to figure out your different, your different outcrosses and things. Um, so anyways, if I don't skip over some of this, we're gonna run out of time. But um, another one of my favorites is egg deconstruction. So you can basically, you take an egg, you know, you talk about candling, you can have the kids pull their phones out, hold it up, um, and you can see all of those different things. And so um, anyways, this resource, all, this, all these different things are available for you guys and for everybody um, to use during that Google form that Mason sent out. And I think what it would really probably most be beneficial to is uh, maybe to new teachers. Um, Cause I know when I first, first um, got into the profession, I was like, okay, I got the ag keys. Um, they gave me a truck and I know I'm teaching animal science. So now what? Right. <laughs> right. And so just having some of these different, um, having some of these different ideas, I, I think are important. Um, um, one of my ag teachers, I was fortunate enough to have three really great ones. Um, and just, a, he said something that, that was really um, important to me and kind of a challenge and was that, you know, I should at least have one to two um, really impactful hands-on activities per week, right? Because that's what separates us from English teachers and, and some of the math teachers, right? Is that hands-on application. Um, and so here's just a bunch of different um, ideas. Um, as some of us are faced with going virtual, um, there's a really great game. It's called Journey 2050. And it's basically, it's at your own pace. The kids basically create their own account and it teaches all about sustainable agriculture. Um, there's the link to that um, right there. The biggest thing that I found that has been helpful and um, somebody alluded to it earlier was this page right here. Um, all these different CDEs, and by all of them, I would say the vast majority of them, all have some type of practical um, portion, right, or the practicums. And so um, this year I'm teaching a, a veterinary science course. So if we click on the CDE um, guidelines here, what do we have? We have basically all of these different hands-on activities that we can do, right? from restraining a dog to, you know, haltering a horse, all of those different kinds of things, you know, administering different shots. Some of these ones up here, like restraining a dog or cat, you can do with a stuffed animal at home, right? Super, super easy um, to be able to, to do. Food science is another one. Um, if you just look at the contest, uh, where is it? There's basically some different parts that can be easily trans transferred into um, um, into basically classroom teaching, right? And that's the triangle test and the aromas. You just go get three different kinds of crackers, right? And you can have them um, differentiate the differences based on these things that are listed here, right? The aromas is something we did in class and I have a picture of it um, right here. So we just bought some extracts at the, um, at the, at the local grocery store, um, took some cotton balls, put it in the bottom of a plastic cup, put another cup over it so they couldn't get the visual um, cue, right, based on coloring and, and things like that. And they basically can just kind of lift up the top cup and smell it and figure out, try to differentiate which one of those different 20 smells it is, right? So that's kind of fun. We can talk about how they're added to different food products um, and those kinds of things. Um, I'm just kind of idea vomiting here. Um, another real great one that we did um, in class, and this kind of goes with uh, the entomology thing that, that uh, was talked about earlier, is um, in natural resources, we talk about um, insects. We also talk about um, aquatic ecosystems, you know, and everyone always gets excited about the fish and things. And so we can kind of combine those two or we'll take something like this picture of a mayfly here and I'll have, um, I had 12 kids in that class. So I just randomly got 12 insects that are commonly found in Oklahoma around aquatic environments. And I gave each one of them a card, right? And so their goal was to try to use household items um, to as closely replicate um, that insect to make a fishing lure. And so I couldn't, I didn't have any pictures of them on my phone, but 
this kind of, right, this, this would be like A plus 100% some I found on the internet, but that kind of emulates, right, the, the mayfly. And so um, it's easy, right, virtually a student could do this at home, take a picture of it, upload it to Google Classroom or whatever, um, whatever particular online learning um, program or, or whatever your school in particular uses, right? And so there's, we've done things like, we'll go some of those grasses that were out behind the school, we'll cut them down, dry them out in the classroom, we'll talk about how that process works. Um, the kids that really enjoy that will have them make range boards to enter for, for the Tulsa Fair. If not, they make a great classroom decoration. Things like giving shots to bananas and oranges, um, obviously electrical wiring boards. Um, electricity is confusing as it is most of the time, at least it was, was for me. Um, but if I can do it and see it, it makes a, a whole lot more sense, right? Um, here's an example of, of in class where we're doing the vet science um, practicum, just making it a, a hands-on activity where kids can learn all these different tools. Um, and then this is what I'll use for, um, for the branding exercise, right? So kids will try to pick three or four of these different things to make, make their wire hanger out of. Mason, on my timer, that gives me about 43 seconds left. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing that and see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, there's a ton of good information you just shared with us, uh, many of which I do intend to steal. And uh, I really, really appreciate that, Owen. Um, I wish for all four of you, we, we would have more time. And, and that's something we've talked about, of course, is that uh, 15 minutes is just not enough, right? And so um, I will encourage all of you that are participants to reach out to these four teachers as the presenters and don't hesitate to, to hit them up throughout the year um, for more ideas and maybe some tips as to how to tackle a certain subject. Um, I know that you know, speaking as we close, um, and we'll, we'll open it up for some questions here in a second, but I just want to say, um, talking to your, your teaching partners and your other folks here around Oklahoma, there's so much we don't know that people are doing on a regular basis, like what we just learned today. And I think it really um, helps to just have these types of conversations formally and informally. And so um, I want to say thank you so much to all four of you today for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. Um, what questions does anyone have um, specific to any of the presentations? And, and do any of you presenters have any more to add now that we've made it through all four? We've had a few remaining through the chat that some are responding to. Um, and I want to remind everyone, uh, matter of fact, let me see if I can drop this in the chat before, I, uh, before we close. What we've received a good amount of feedback throughout the five sessions we've had previously. Um, in regards to how to make things better. Um, we are already thinking about future opportunities in terms of professional development that we want to offer for teachers. We hope to someday be able to do it in person and dig deeper into these subjects and um, host them at different facilities to where we can also tour and see other folks ag ed facilities um, and what you're doing there. And I think that will be really impactful. Um, I do notice uh, there's uh, from Mr. Lastly talked about how long after the bug dies can you start pinning them. Um, some of those questions, Bart, if you wanted to respond to that, you could. Um, but I, you know, I just wanted you all to know that, and I'm going to keep it open for a little bit. This is fine. We're not in any big rush at this point, but um, any other questions that y'all may have, I'm going to go ahead and shut up and let y'all respond to some of these. I'll address that question real quick. Um, you know, you can put bugs in the freezer too, uh, you know, and you can just find dead bugs. Uh, if you put them in the freezer, when you get them out to pin them, um, you got to let them thaw a little bit, depending on how long you had them in there. Um, if I use nail polish remover, uh, depends on how much and how strong it is, but, um, you know, a couple of hours maybe, but typically for kids, we catch them and I tell them we'll come in tomorrow and we'll pin them. So kind of overnight deal on that one. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, John, but that's um, what I got on that. Anyone else have any other questions too for our presenters? We've had some good comments in the chat. I would refer everyone there. Um, 
Uh, Mr. Coulter talked about uh, what they've been doing at the Muscogee region meetings, uh, just the idea shares. Um, and, you know, there, there's been off and on, and I agree with you, Mr. Coulter, from year to one year to the next, whether it be locally, regionally, area level, um, more idea sharing. And that's what it's all about. I know, Mr. Coulter, you've probably sat through every single one of these, have you not? And uh, it's because, you know, we we want to get it, these ideas and I've taken a lot away from, from this. And so I, I'll speak for myself and saying I've enjoyed it. And um, don't be surprised any of you participants that we don't hit you up in the future you know, as far as trying to host more opportunities like this. Um, I think, you know, knowing from learning from those of us that are all in, actively engaged and in service, um, we're, we're getting all these new ideas. And so um, I will, I will also mention something that Mr. Harper had said, you know, we'd like to, even in this day and age, be able to provide more resources as recorded videos as well. And uh, whether it be um, what, like what we are doing here or quick short videos that are pre-recorded that a teacher just makes at their ag building and can submit, um, be on the lookout. Uh, having visited with Mr. Nemechek, there are plans to have a YouTube channel um, for ag ed professional development and for ag ed teachers just to kind of keep them informed and help them in professional development. Hopefully we can, help contribute to adding to that video library and making that uh, something that we can all benefit from going forward. Um, is there any other questions before we close uh, specific to this or any, any other for our presenters? Well, uh, don't hesitate to uh, fill out that evaluation form in the chat. We will all receive a follow-up email as well from me. And uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you need to connect with any of these presenters or uh, have any other questions going forward. We are, as a STAR committee, seeking you know, any good suggestion and ideas for how we can help in the future with um, recruitment and retention initiatives, uh, but then things just like this that help with professional development and help make your job easier, that's what we're about as well. And so um, Cameron and I, uh, don't, we're both here in this meeting, make sure and hit us up anytime, and uh, we're happy to help it however we can. So. Thank you all for participating and, and definitely hope to hear back from you in terms of the Google form feedback. So thank you.